Volume Three, Part Eighteen of Herodotus Histories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Histories, Volume Three, by Herodotus of Halicarnassus, translated by E. D. Godley, Part Eighteen. During the drawing up of battle formation, there arose much dispute between the Tegeans and the Athenians for each of them claimed that they should hold the second wing of the army, justifying themselves by tales of deeds new and old. First the Tegeans spoke. We, among all the allies, have always had the right to hold this position in all campaigns, of the united Peloponnesian armies, both ancient and recent, ever since that time when the Heraclidae, after Eurystheus' death, attempted to return to the Peloponnese. We gained because of the achievement which we will relate. When we marched out at the Isthmus for war, along with the Achaeans and Ionians, who then dwelt in the Peloponnese, and encamped opposite the returning exiles, then, it is said, Hillas announced that army should not be risked against army in battle, but that the champion in the host of the Peloponnesians, whom they chose as their best, should fight with him in single combat on agreed conditions. The Peloponnesians, resolving that this should be so, swore a compact that if Hillas should overcome the Peloponnesian champion, the Heraclidae should return to the land of their fathers. But if he were himself beaten, then the Heraclidae should depart and lead their army away, not attempting to return to the Peloponnese until a hundred years had passed. Then our general and king Echemus, son of Phegeus's son Europus, volunteered and was chosen out of all the allied host. He fought that duel and killed Hillas. It was for that feat of arms that the Peloponnesians granted us this in addition to other great privileges, which we have never ceased to possess, namely, that in all united campaigns we should always lead the army's second wing. Now with you, men of Lacedaemon, we have no rivalry, but forbear and bid you choose the command of whichever wing you want. We do, however, say that our place is at the head of the other, as it has always been, Quite apart from that feat which we have related, we are worthier than the Athenians to hold that post, for we have fought many battles which turned out favorably for you, men of Lacedaemon, and others besides. It is accordingly we, and not the Athenians, who should hold the second wing, for neither at some earlier period nor recently have they achieved such feats of arms as we. To these words the Athenians replied, It is our belief that we are gathered for battle with the barbarian, and not for speeches, but since the man of Tegea has made it his business to speak of all the valorous deeds, old and new, which either of our nations has at any time achieved, we must prove to you how we, rather than Arcadians, have by virtue of our valor a hereditary right to the place of honor. These Tegeans say that they killed the leader of the Heraclidae at the Isthmus. Now when those same Heraclidae had been rejected by every Greek people to whom they resorted to escape the tyranny of the Mycenaeans, we alone received them. With them we vanquished those who then inhabited the Peloponnese, and we broke the pride of Eurystheus. Furthermore, when the Argives who had marched with Polynicus against Thebes had there made an end of their lives and lay unburied, know that we sent our army against the Cadmeans, and recovered the dead and buried them in Eleusis. We also have on record our great victory against the Amazons, who once came from the river Thermodon and broke into Attica, and in the hard days of Troy we were second to none. But since it is useless to recall those matters, for those who were previously valiant may now be of lesser metal, and those who lacked metal then may be better men now, enough of the past. Supposing that we were known for no achievement, although the fact is that we have done more than any other of the Greeks, we nevertheless deserve to have this honor and more beside, because of the role we played at Marathon, seeing that alone of all the Greeks we met the Persians single-handedly, and did not fail in that enterprise but overcame forty-six nations. Is it not then our right to hold this post, for that one feat alone? Yet seeing that this is no time for wrangling about our place in battle, we are ready to obey you, men of Lacedaemon, and take whatever place and face whatever enemy you think fitting. Wherever you see us, we will strive to be valiant men. Command us, then, knowing that we will obey." This was the Athenians' response, and the whole army shouted aloud that the Athenians were worthier to hold the wing than the Arcadians. It was in this way that the Athenians were preferred to the men of Tegea, and gained that place. 
Presently the whole Greek army was arrayed as I will show, both the later and the earliest comers. On the right wing were ten thousand Lacedaemons. Five thousand of these, who were Spartans, had a guard of thirty-five thousand light-armed helots, seven appointed for each man. The Spartans chose the Tegeans for their neighbors in the battle, both to do them honor, and for their valor. There were of these fifteen hundred men-at-arms. Next to these in the line were five thousand Corinthians, at whose desire Pausanias permitted the three hundred Potidaeans from Pallene, then present, to stand by them. Next to these were six hundred Arcadians from Orchomenus, and after them three thousand men of Sicyon. By these one thousand Trozenians were posted, and after them two hundred men of Leprium, then four hundred from Mycenae and Tyrans, and next to them one thousand from Phleas. By these stood three hundred men of Hermione. Next to the men of Hermione were six hundred Eritreans and Styrians, next to them four hundred Chalcadians, next again five hundred Ampersiots. After these stood eight hundred Lucidians and Anactorians, and next to them two hundred from Pale and Cephalenia. After them in the array, five hundred Agenitans. By them stood three thousand men of Magara, and next to these six hundred Pilthaeans. At the end, and first in the line, were the Athenians who held the left wing. They were eight thousand in number, and their general was Aristides, son of Lysimachus. All these, except the seven appointed to attend each Spartan, were men-at-arms, and the whole sum of them was thirty-eight thousand and seven hundred. This was the number of men-at-arms that mustered for war against the barbarian. As regards the number of the light-armed men, there were in the Spartan army seven for each man-at-arms, that is, thirty-five thousand, and every one of these was equipped for war. The light arm from the rest of Lacedaemon and Hellas were as one to every man-at-arms, and their number was thirty-four thousand and five hundred. So the total of all the light-armed men who were fighting was sixty-nine thousand five hundred, and of the whole Greek army mustered at Plataea, men-at-arms and light-armed fighting men together, eleven times ten thousand, less eighteen hundred. The Thespians who were present were one hundred and ten thousand in number, for the survivors of the Thespians were also present with the army, eighteen hundred in number. These then were arrayed and encamped by the Asopus. When Mardonius's barbarians had finished their mourning for Mesistius and heard that the Greeks were at Plataea, they also came to the part of the Asopus river nearest to them. When they were there, they arrayed for battle by Mardonius, as I shall show. He posted the Persians facing the Lacedaemonians. Seeing that the Persians by far outnumbered the Lacedaemonians, they were arrayed in deeper ranks, and their line ran opposite the Tegeans also. In his arraying of them he chose out the strongest part of the Persians to set it over against the Lacedaemonians, and posted the weaker by them facing the Tegeans. This he did so, being informed and taught by the Thebans. Next to the Persians he posted the Medes opposite the men of Corinth, Potidaea, Orchomenus, and Sicyon. Next to the Medes, the Bactrians, opposite the men of Epidaurus, Tyrans, Mycenae, and Phleas. After the Bactrians he set the Indians, opposite the men of Hermione and Eritrea, and Styra, and Chalcis. Next to the Indians he posted the Sasse, opposite the Amprisiots, Anactorians, Lucadians, Peleans, and Aeginitans. Next to the Sasse, and opposite the Athenians, Plataeans, Megarians, the Boeotians, Locrians, Malians, Thessalians, and the thousand that came from Phocis. For not all the Phocians took the Persian side, but some of them gave their aid to the Greek cause. These had been besieged on Parnassus, and issued out from there to harry Mardonius's army, and the Greeks who were with him. Beside these he arrayed the Macedonians also, and those who lived in the area of Thessaly opposite the Athenians. These which I have named were the greatest of the nations set in array by Mardonius, but there was also in the army a mixture of Phrygians, Thracians, Mysians, Paeonians, and the rest, besides Ethiopians and the Egyptian swordsmen called Hermotibes and Calisiris, who are the only fighting men in Egypt. These had been fighters on shipboard, till Mardonius, while yet at Phalerum, disembarked them from their ships, for the Egyptians were not appointed to serve in the land army which Xerxes led to Athens. Of the barbarians, then, there were three hundred thousand, as I have already shown. As for the Greek allies of Mardonius, no one knows the number of them, for they were not counted. I suppose them to have been mustered to the number of fifty thousand. 
These were the footmen that were set in array, the cavalry were separately ordered. On the second day after they had all been arrayed according to their nations and their battalions, both armies offered sacrifice. It was Tisimenes who sacrificed for the Greeks, for he was with their army as a diviner. He was an Elean by birth, a Clitiad of the Iomid clan, and the Lacedaemonians gave him the freedom of their city. This they did, for when Tisimenes was inquiring of the oracle at Delphi concerning offspring, the priestess prophesied to him that he should win five great victories. Not understanding that oracle, he engaged in bodily exercise, thinking that he would then be able to win in similar sports. When he had trained himself for the five contests, he came within one wrestling bout of winning the Olympic prize, in a match with Hieronymus of Andros. The Lacedaemonians, however, perceived that the oracle given to Tisimenes spoke of the lists not of sport but of war, and they attempted to bribe Tisimenes to be a leader in their wars jointly with their kings of Heracles' line. When he saw that the Spartans set great store by his friendship, he set his price higher, and made it known to them that he would do what they wanted only in exchange for the gift of full citizenship and all of the citizens' rights. Hearing that, the Spartans were at first angry and completely abandoned their request, but when the dreadful menace of this Persian host hung over them, they consented and granted his demand. When he saw their purpose changed, he said that he would not be content with that alone. His brother Hegeus, too, must be made a Spartan on the same terms as himself. By so saying he imitated Melampus, in so far as one may compare demands for kingship with those for citizenship. For when the women of Argos had gone mad, and the Argives wanted him to come from Pylos and heal them of that madness, Melampus demanded half of their kingship for his wages. This the Argives would not put up with, and departed. When, however, the madness spread among their women, they promised what Melampus demanded, and were ready to give it to him. Thereupon, seeing their purpose changed, he demanded yet more, and said that he would not do their will except if they gave a third of their kingship to his brother Bias. Now driven into dire straits, the Argives consented to that also. The Spartans, too, were so eagerly desirous of winning to Semenus that they granted everything that he demanded. When they had granted him this also, Tisimenus of Illus, now a Spartan, engaged in divination for them, and aided them to win five very great victories. No one on earth, save Tisimenus and his brother, ever became citizens of Sparta. Now the five victories were these. One, the first, this victory at Plataea. Next, that which was won at Tegea over the Tegeans and Argives. After that, over all the Arcadians, save the Mentoneans at Dipea next, over the Messinians at Ithome, lastly, the victory at Tanagra over the Athenians and Argives, which was the last one of the five victories. This Tisimenus had now been brought by the Spartans, and was the diviner of the Greeks at Plataea. The sacrifices boded good to the Greeks if they would just defend themselves, but evil if they should cross the Esopus and be the first to attack. Mardonius's sacrifices also foretold an unfavorable outcome if he should be zealous to attack first, and good if he should but defend himself. He too used the Greek manner of sacrifice, and Hegesistratus of Elis was his diviner, the most notable of the sons of Tellius. This man had been put in prison and condemned to die by the Spartans for the great harm which he had done them. Being in such bad shape, inasmuch as he was in peril of his life, and was likely to be very grievously maltreated before his death, he did something which was almost beyond belief. Made fast in iron-bound stocks, he got an iron weapon which was brought in some way into his prison, and straightway conceived a plan of such courage as we have never known. Reckoning how best the rest of it might get free, he cut off his own foot at the instep. This done, he tunneled through the wall out of the way of the guards who kept watch over him, and so escaped to Tegea. All night he journeyed, and all day he hid and lay in the woods, till on the third night he came to Tegea, while all the people of Lacedaemon sought him. The latter were greatly amazed when they saw the half of his foot which had been cut off and lying there, but were unable to find the man himself. This, then, is the way in which he escaped the Lacedaemonians and took refuge in Tegea, which at that time was unfriendly to Lacedaemon. After, after he was healed and had made himself a foot of wood, he declared himself an open enemy of the Lacedaemonians. Yet the enmity which he bore them brought no good at the last for they caught him at his divinations in Zacynthus, and killed him. The death of Hegesistratus, however, took place after the Plataean business. 
At the present he was by the Asopus, hired by Mordonius for no small wage, where he sacrificed and worked zealously, both for the hatred he bore the Lacedaemonians and for gain. When no favorable omens for battle could be won either by the Persians themselves or by the Greeks who were with them, for they too had a diviner of their own, Hippomachus of Lucas, and the Greeks kept flocking in and their army grew, Timogenes, son of Herpes, a Theban, advised Mardonius to guard the outlet of the pass over Catharin, telling him that the Greeks were coming in daily, and that he would thereby cut off many of them. The armies had already lain hidden opposite each other for eight days when he gave this counsel. Mardonius perceived that the advice was good, and when night had fallen, he sent his horsemen to the outlet of the pass over Catharin, which leads towards Plataea. This pass the Boeotians call the Three Heads, and the Athenians the Oaks Heads. The horsemen who were sent out did not go in vain, for they caught both five hundred beasts of burden which were going into the low country, bringing provisions from the Peloponnese for the army, and men who came with the wagons. When they had taken this quarry, the Persians killed without mercy, sparing neither man nor beast. When they had their fill of slaughter, they encircled the rest and drove them to Mardonius and his camp. After this deed they waited two days more, neither side desiring to begin the battle, for although the barbarians came to the Asopus to test the Greeks' intent, neither army crossed it. Mardonius's cavalry, however, kept pressing upon and troubling the Greeks, for the Thebans, in their zeal for the Persian part, waged war heartily, and kept on guiding the horsemen to the encounter. Thereafter it was the turn of the Persians and Medes, and they and none other would do deeds of valor. Until ten days passed, no more was done than this. On the eleventh day from their first encampment opposite each other, the Greeks, growing greatly in number and Mardonius being greatly vexed by the delay, there was a debate held between Mardonius, son of Gobrius, and Artabazus, son of Pharnacus, who stood as high as only a few others in Xerxes' esteem. Their opinions in council were as I will show. Artabazus thought it best that they should strike their camp with all speed and lead the whole army within the walls of Thebes. Here there was much food stored and fodder for their beasts of burden. Furthermore, they could sit at their ease here and conclude the business by doing as follows. They could take the great store they had of gold, minted and other, and silver drinking cups, and send all this to all places in Hellas without stint, excepting none, but especially to the chief men in the cities of Hellas. Let them do this, he said, and the Greeks would quickly surrender their liberty, but do not let the Persians risk the event of a battle. This opinion of his was the same as the Thebans, inasmuch as he too had special foreknowledge. Mardonius's counsel, however, was more vehement and intemperate, and not at all leaning to moderation. He said that he thought their army was much stronger than the Greeks, and that they should give battle with all speed, so as not to let more Greeks muster than were mustered already. As for the sacrifices of Hegesistratus, let them pay no heed to these, nor seek to wring good from them, but rather give battle after Persian custom. No one withstood this argument, and his opinion accordingly prevailed, for it was he and not Artabasis who was commander of the army by the king's commission. He therefore sent for the leaders of the battalions and the generals of those Greeks who were with him, and asked them if they knew any oracle which prophesied that the Persians should perish in Hellas. Those who were summoned said nothing, some not knowing the prophecies, and some knowing them but thinking it perilous to speak. And then Mardonius himself said, Since you either have no knowledge, or are afraid to declare it, hear what I tell you based on the full knowledge that I have. There is an oracle that Persians are fated to come to Hellas, and all perish there, after they have plundered the temple at Delphi. Since we have knowledge of this same oracle, we will neither approach that temple nor attempt to plunder it, in so far as destruction hinges on that, none awaits us. Therefore, as many of you as wish the Persians well may rejoice in that we will overcome the Greeks. Having spoken in this way, he gave command to have everything prepared and put in good order for the battle, which would take place early the next morning. Now for this prophecy, which Mardonius said was spoken of the Persians, I know it to have been made concerning not them but the Illyrians and the army of the Enchiles. There is, however, a prophecy made by Bacchus concerning this battle. By Thermidon's stream and the grass-grown banks of Asopus will be a gathering of Greeks for fight and the ring of the barbarians' war-cry. Many a Median archer, by untimely death overtaken, will fall, there in the battle when the day of his doom is upon him. 
I know that these verses and others very similar to them from Mosius refer to the Persians. As for the river Thermodon, it flows between Tanagra and Glissus. End of volume three, part eighteen.